to ask for permission for recording and also please identify yourselves once you are ready to pose your questions, your names, and of course, the organization, the media organization you represent. And with that, let's just get started. Mr. County Executive, please. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will uh, go through a number of things today. I mean, yesterday's cases, we have uh, 92 new cases as of yesterday, and our test positivity uh, was 2.9%. So we've been able to keep our test positivity relatively low. 92 cases is still more cases than we would like to see, far more cases than we would like to see. Uh, last Friday, we signed a contract with uh, Scion Diagnostics to serve as our primary provider for COVID-19 testing. It's the same company we've been working with um, through the state for the last few weeks. So there will not be any further have need to switch over or pause as the state's testing support fades out. And, the con and we have continuity with Scion, who was the, the support we were getting from the state. Um, it's a significant development for us. And I wanna really thank our team for resolving this matter quickly and getting ourselves in a position that we can um, maintain continuity. Uh, we've been ramping up our testing operations. We're gonna to continue to do that. Uh, we're testing at Wheaton. Today we're testing at Wheaton Library and the Community Recreation Center and at the mobile trailer at Lake Forest Mall. And uh, so far the turnaround for test results at Scion has been averaging 48 hours. Um, this is all very important to us. Um, and just so everybody knows, we continue to be looking at the rapid test. The governor has announced that he's, he has tests. Um, we don't know how many we're going to get, but we, knew that, we do know that their focus is going to be on nursing homes and other critical personnel. These are not meant for general consumption at this point, but the county is looking um, at companies that will bring these tests online and hopes that we'll also um, be announcing progress in bringing those tests into the county. Um, obviously, we believe the more testing we do, the safer we can make people and the quicker we can get control on things and the rapid tests have even more advantages than uh, the tests we're using right now. Um, although we're ramping up testing, we continue to see a reduction in volume of the people coming in for testing in the county and around the state. And we're encouraging people to please come in and get tested. It's important to avoid spreading the virus. And we have to remind people that you may have the virus enough to be symptomatic. And that is the big problem with this. You don't know everybody who's sick. And so it's possible to be positive and spreading virus and not showing any signs of it. And that is one of the dangers. That's one of the things that allowed this virus to spread so quickly. So we really are encouraging people to get tested. So if we find positive cases, we can do the contact tracing and get a handle on the spread of the virus as quickly as possible. In other news of interest, um, we have um, expanded live music perform performance provision. We'll now allow outdoor performances under the, allow under the following conditions. Performances must adhere to the 50 person gathering restrictions. There will be a possibility the cast and crew and staff are counted separately. And there will be guidelines on how this will um, be handled. And Dr. Stoddard, um, can further explain this. Audience members must practice physical distancing by sitting at least six feet away from any individuals outside their house, households. The venue is submitting is responsible for submitting a letter um, for approval, which includes a seating chart that demonstrates these social distancing practices. And again, Dr. Stoddard will go into more detail on that provision. We continue to work with the restaurants. We know they have asked us to um, extend or re-extend the hours of selling alcohol beyond 10 o'clock. Um, our folks had a meeting with them this week. We're working to see if there is a way to do this. Um, we're looking at the potential of some kind of opt-in where there would be certain restrictions and enforcement that they would have to agree to follow. And I wanna emphasize, have to agree to follow because this doesn't work 
if we say you can open up and then we go in there and we find people crowding around bars, moving tables around to be close to each other, standing up in the middle of the bar or in the restaurant and talking to each other. If it's gonna be done, it's gotta be done safely. Uh, we've launched our mask up campaign. I wanna remind people the importance of wearing a mask. Um, for the last week, we've been pushing our mask up campaign and Montgomery County is government is partnering with the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, Visit Montgomery and the local business community to promote the importance of wearing a mask or face covering. And again, I wanna give credit to the business community by and large, which has been very supportive of this because they understand that our ability to control the virus is also tied to our ability to keep businesses open. And so it's in everybody's best interest that we mask up all the time. That's what I encourage people to do this. Um, campaigns designed to educate county residents and visitors about the importance of wearing a mask in public and outdoors and when you're unable to maintain physical distance. As I said before, wearing a mask is key to stopping the spread and the mask keeps you safe, but it also keeps the people around you safe. So this is a mutually beneficial arrangement if we all wear masks. Um, voting in elections, uh, this has obviously been a big topic on the national seed. Our Board of Elections is encouraging voters to start a vote plan for the upcoming election. Registering to vote or ensuring your voter registration is current is critical. The deadline to register to vote is October 13th. Again, that's the deadline for registration. Due to COVID-19, the board is recommending voting by mail. It is the preferred way to vote. We will have voting centers um, available on election day, but it will not be the usual 200 voting sites. So I think it's down to somewhere between 40 and 50 voting sites. I don't remember the last number, but we need as many people to vote by mail as possible. And when you vote by mail, we, we want people to do the vote by mail, not use the email ballot. If you use an email ballot, it has to come in and be transferred to another ballot because the machines can't process the email ballots. So if you vote by mail, then that vote can be processed by the machine, which means they can be read quickly. So this is really important. For voters who choose or must vote in person, early balloting, early voting will run October 26th to November 2nd, election day, November 3rd. Voters can cast ballots in person at any early voting center or public high school. And again, as I said before, there will not be the usual 200 plus voting sites on election day. There is a map up on the county website of where, these, where the election sites are going to be, voting sites are gonna be. So make note of that and make your plans. And again, make it easier on all of us and vote by mail, US mail, not internet email. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gales now. Uh, good afternoon and happy Wednesday, everybody. Always good to be with you all. Uh, I'll try to keep my remarks brief and save time for questions. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of key points. Uh, the county executive mentioned that our numbers have been in the area or test positivity has been somewhere between 2.9% and 3.3%. Uh, over the last, uh, well, since the governors uh, opened up for phase three across the state and other jurisdictions. And since Labor Day, we've actually had four days that are over 100 or close to uh, 100 cases uh, in terms of testing positive. Now, when we look at our red cap numbers, again, the red cap numbers are breaking cases down based upon the day that the test was actually drawn as opposed to the date that the result was reported in terms of how the state reports those. We've uh, uh, just to give you a sample of that in terms of where the numbers are, on September 8th, we had 121, September 9th, 119, September 10th, 98 cases, and September 11th, 101 cases resulted so far. And we continue to update those numbers. So I do want to explain to folks at home when they're asking where do the numbers lie, the numbers have been increasing in our jurisdiction and we're continuing to follow those trends. Now, at the same time, we have not seen to date a comparable increase in hospital utilization or emergency room utilization uh, and our COVID related fatalities have stayed uh, low. 
We've had multiple days where we've had zero COVID related deaths. And in addition to that, we continue to see trends of a higher percentage of new cases coming from younger populations. Again, over 50% of cases at the state level and local level are between the ages of zero to 30 years of age. Uh, and approximately 26 to 27% of those new cases are in the zero to 19 year old age group. Now, the other thing I wanted to provide an update on in, in terms of talking about numbers is that we, we did, uh, we were asked a question last week about uh, cases related to schools, uh, particularly non-public schools. Uh, since our conversation on last Thursday, we have had nine additional schools uh, require an investigation or contact with the local health department due to concerns of COVID-like symptoms or illnesses reported by students, staff, and or teachers. Uh, in most of those situations, in seven of those situations, uh, once the individuals were tested and we received the results, they were negative, we were able to release or relax any of the quarantine uh, provisions that had been put into place in a number of those schools. Uh, we do have two ongoing investigations, uh, one that we received uh, within the last 24 hours that um, could involve multiple students. And as we you know, continue to investigate that process, we will continue to support the schools uh, with the expertise and advice and guidance in terms of what they need to do in terms of uh, contacting the, the relevant folks who are contacts and need to take further action, whether it's quarantine, isolate, get further testing, or make any further decisions based upon the operations of those settings. So we continue to support uh, the schools in that way. Uh, Dr. Stoddard and I uh, held our a weekly, not, well not weekly, but we held a, a meeting with, with schools on last Friday. Uh, we have another meeting scheduled this Friday to talk through logistics to help provide further guidance and clarification to the state guidelines as well as address any other operational or public health related questions uh, that the schools have during those, those times to make sure that they stay safe and they're able to operate safely. Now the testing apparatus we also mentioned in a number of our most recent press briefings that there have been concerns about decreased testing across the state within our jurisdiction. Uh, the numbers have improved slightly in terms of testing capacity. We continue to expand our testing opportunities on a local level, uh, working very carefully and closely with our healthcare enterprise. As the county executive mentioned, uh, the governor had mentioned in one of his recent press conferences, and we're excited about the prospect of having rapid point of care testing made available in our jurisdictions. Uh, we're still awaiting more information related to that, but as he referenced, the likelihood the higher priority uh, groups will be our nursing homes and other congregate living situations uh, for first, uh, first run on those, those rapid tests. Uh, the other thing I want to also emphasize is that we continue to work with our colleagues across the region uh, related to vaccine dissemination and distribution. We are hopeful that there will be at least one viable vaccine candidate, uh, likely sometime early to mid next year. Uh, and we are working behind the scenes with our colleagues on a standardized stratified distribution uh, process to ensure that everyone who needs a vaccine will be able to get the vaccine. Now the early information released from the federal level has suggested that there will be a prioritization process put into place uh, and there will be more details provided on how those priorities will be determined, who those priority groups will be, and how the vaccine will be distributed to state and local jurisdictions to allow us to plan more in depth and detail. Now, in the, in, while we're waiting for the, the COVID vaccine to come, there is a vaccine that is present now that we are encouraging folks to get, and that's your flu shot. So I want to remind folks that flu shots are available now. It is not too early to get your shot. I got my shot earlier this week. Today's Wednesday. I got it on Monday. I think we posted it on uh, social media and we've been encouraging uh, folks to post your your experience so that you can encourage others within your network to do so and the last thing I want to emphasize is that a reminder to folks that there's lots of information flying around right now it's an election season and we encourage folks to read up when you hear something find a source look into it don't just take it as gospel 
Uh, and the one thing that I want to emphasize is that we continue to encourage everyone to get tested, asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. And we are not resting and allowing us to accept a baseline of 80 to 90 cases a day. And we are not accepting that we're going to just say everyone gets sick and achieve herd immunity and we've done our jobs. We are dedicated and committed to doing everything we can to continue to drive the the number of cases down so that we lower the burden of the virus in our community, lower the impact of community transmission, and that will hopefully allow us to be able to reopen more activities uh, within our society. I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Travis. Dr. Stoddard, opening yeah, statement. I, yeah, I only have a few comments that I want to make. Uh, uh, echoing what the county executive said about live performances, we will be uh, issuing some additional guidance today and it will be up on our website where you can apply for a letter of approval for outdoor performances. We know that obviously the time is ticking on outdoor activities uh, being able to be done throughout the fall and so that those will be up later today. You can currently submit letters of approval that will meet those uh, guidelines. They'll be reviewed quickly and we can hopefully get performances uh, allowed to operate uh, across the county over the next week, you know, week or so. Um, we also are meeting with the members of the faith community later today. Um, we know the high holidays are rapidly approaching. Uh, we've heard a lot of concerns about the ability to, to allow people to practice their faith during these high, high holidays. Uh, we are still concerned, obviously, about COVID-19 and about the significant increase that we have seen since, um, you know, since the uh, holiday, since Labor Day and, and over the last several weeks but we're looking for ways that we can essentially allow the faith community to have some expanded internal capacity while offsetting the risk associated with that by having additional provisions in other places like in how we stagger entrances and exits from the from the sanctuaries things of that nature and so we'll be meeting with them today to find out what can work for all faith traditions in montgomery county and hopefully come to some accord on um you know how we can allow some additional capacity while off offset that risk through other, through other recommendations or rules or accommodations. Uh, lastly, uh, we've heard several questions about Halloween. I think, I think it's really important to understand that we are still a, a bit six weeks away from that. And it's really difficult to know exactly what Montgomery County is gonna look like on Halloween today. Uh, we are preparing guidelines and guidance based on what is out there from other places. Uh, we recognize that many of the Halloween activities are not government driven, nor are they driven by businesses in most cases. And so we will be providing guidance to try and try and do what, what we think is safe. But at the same time, it, we can't say too much today because we do not know what the circumstances of COVID-19 will be at the end of October. And, it's, you know, obviously we're, we are trying to follow the data and the science and uh, prognostication is not our forte. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you all to the three of you. And with that, let's open it up for questions. Uh, with members of the media. Remember to um, identify yourselves and the outlet organization you represent. First question, Rebecca Tan from the Washington Post, uh, and she has questions for the county executive and also for Dr. Gales. Rebecca. Hello. Oh, hi, great. Um, thank you for having, having me. Um, my first question, is about the sign diagnostics contract. I'm wondering if either County Executive Alrich or Dr. Gales could tell me a little bit more about what it is, how many tests are they providing, for how long. Um, and my second question is for Dr. Gales. Um, you mentioned that cases appear to be ticking up in Montgomery County this week. Do you have you know, a sense of why is it? Do you think it's directly related to the reopening uh, of the state moving into phase three? And if so, since Montgomery you know, opted out of that, like why our cases are ticking up still. Um, thank you. I believe Dr. Gales needs to be on the okay. Good. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, so the, the first comment related to the Scion contract, um, it's basically a, an open contract that's continuing to allow us to utilize the lab that uh, stepped in uh, and we worked with over the last month uh, following our pivot from utilizing the other lab that we had used to support our high throughput testing uh, mechanism. Uh, and so we don't, uh, you know, the provisions of the contract are 
private, but you know, we don't have necessarily a minimum testing that, uh, requirement that we have with them. Uh, we are utilizing right now uh, anterior nares testing, which is the same testing technique that we've used over the last month uh, to support our different test sites um, across the county. Now, as we move forward, we have uh, met with a number of other labs uh, to form partnerships as well to provide additional services to help support the testing apparatus and the different components. Uh, and we are also looking at uh, uh, particularly labs who are, are exploring or bringing online rapid testing modalities that would allow us to be able to expand the provisions of our testing to do uh, on-site testing and provide those results within a shorter window of time. Uh, and that could create other opportunities that would, uh, for example, allow us to initiate the contact tracing piece more uh, immediately uh, than right now where we, you know, we're waiting on the results where that can be somewhere between 48 to 72 hours. So we're continuing to, to continuing to pursue partnerships with entities that are able to leverage the newest uh, technologies as they become available. Now on the second component, um, as related to the cases in, in terms of what we've seen. So we think that there are a number of factors that are potentially driving the increase in cases. Uh, and so the first one is that we've talked about before is that we think that over time there has been a little bit of relaxation uh, in terms of adherence to uh, sticking to those public health principles in terms of face coverings and physical distancing, particularly as a relates to large gatherings and family gatherings. And we've talked before, uh, particularly around holiday season, we know that that is not an uncommon time where families and close networks get together. And we know that when we're in those settings, there is a tendency, unfortunately, to relax and to let down our guard a little bit. And that makes it easier for the virus to transmit if we're not wearing our face coverings and, you know, we're hugging and in close proximity and touching and, you know, not observing and adhering to those physical distance guidelines. I think there are other things that can contribute to it as well. One is it was a holiday season as well. And so lots of people are moving back and forth and they're going to other jurisdictions. They're not necessarily staying at home. And it does create some challenges when folks are able to travel to other places where there are less restrictions in place and they may be coming into contact uh, with the virus in those settings and potentially bringing it back to our jurisdiction. Now we have not had a chance to uh, or we have not received the most recent contact tracing report for this week uh, but we will continue to review that to see if there are any other particular activities that jump out um, that may be causing that uptick. So in summary letting down our guard a little bit particularly in family gatherings and large spaces the, se the secondary effects and influences of holiday seasons. We know holidays have been associated with upticks in cases shortly thereafter. And there is the potential that yes, people may have been in other jurisdictions and other areas where there are less restrictions and may have come into contact with the virus and brought it home. And if I may add just to that point, if you'll remember all the way back in April, and I know it seems like a lifetime ago, whenever we tried to think about closing things down, we typically wanted to opt do so in partnership with neighboring jurisdictions, Northern Virginia and elsewhere. And the reason we wanted to do that then and why it matters now what others are doing is because there is a great uh, deal of efficacy in either opening or closing things down on a, on a concerted basis. Now, obviously, um, we, have, we have residents who live in Montgomery County and work elsewhere. We have residents who, we have, we have people who work in Montgomery County but live elsewhere. Uh, and so obviously we are, um, we, we are on an island and therefore we are affected by what goes on around us in a way that, um, you know, can be challenging to us. And for that reason, I mean, I think if you asked uh, Dr. Gales or myself what we'd like to look like, I think we'd all like to look a lot more like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut uh, and where their numbers are before we reopened a great deal of things. But uh, given the, the, given the way that the region and the state have operated, it would be nearly impossible for us to get to that level j just by ourselves. And therefore, that's why, you know, we're, we're feeling sort of the challenge of how, how do you balance out uh, getting your numbers down while recognizing that you are, you, you don't control all the things that affect you. Okay. And with that, Amy Cho has, um, from NBC4 has a question regarding phase three. Amy, was that answer for you? Or would you like to uh, pose a question? Um, 
Um, yeah, I can I can just read it. Um, just uh, do you guys have an update for um, when Montgomery County is expected to move into phase three? I think at we are going to. Yeah, go, at, go ahead. At this time, uh, we don't. Um, and you know, let, let's at, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, let's go back to what we've talked about for the last several months in terms of how we move forward. We need to see demonstrated lower community transmission. And let's be very clear, the numbers where we were, the levels where we were as a local jurisdiction, as well as the state, <coughs> when the governor made the decision to move to phase three, our numbers were higher than where we were back in July when we moved to phase two. And so that is not consistent from an epidemiological standpoint and a surveillance standpoint with our beliefs in terms of where we need to be to move forward. Now, what we are working on, in fact, taking feedback from a number of places, is we're working on taking the data that we have in our dashboard and simplifying it in ways that the public can understand in terms of the criteria that we're looking at in terms of moving forward, or to be perfectly candid, creating criteria that we may have to move backwards in terms of our provisions if the, the numbers uh, were to increase or continue to move forward as opposed to, to, to decreasing. Uh, and again, to remind you some of the factors that we look at within that, we look at the daily caseload, we look at that in reference to, again, our hospitalization data and utilization, our fatality rates, the measures that give us proxy for the severity of the illness. We look at our rate of transmission mission. We also look at, uh, you know, the cases per 100,000. And so these are consistent with some of the, the, the markers and measures that the state has used, for example, in creating the criteria for schools to reopen. They use test positivity as well as cases per 100,000. And Dr. Stoddard just made a great point uh, in terms of when we compare ourselves to other states and other jurisdictions in terms of having uh, how we move forward, we'd love to be able to achieve comparable levels of lower transmission. You know, when we look at states like New York and Connecticut, I think Connecticut's test positivity is below one and their cases per 100,000 are well below five. And similarly, the state of New York and New York City are at those levels. And so we'd like to see continued improvement. We'd love to see at minimum moderate levels of transmission. And again, CDC definition, moderate levels of transmission for us are in the range of 30 to 34 cases a day. And ultimately, we'd love to see low to no transmission and low transmission for us by CDC definition would be approximately 10 cases per 100, uh, I'm sorry, not 10 cases per 100,000, but 10 cases a day. Um, and so we'd like to get to those levels and see sustained levels because the key is when we lower community transmission, we decrease the likelihood that an individual is stepping into a school, a business, a gym, whatever facility, we decrease the likelihood that they are stepping in COVID positive, which thereby would decrease the likelihood that they were transmitted to other people. Okay, Kate Ryan with uh, WTOP has questions for the county executive as well as for Dr. Gales. Kate. That's right, thank you. Okay, uh, first question for Dr. Gales. Um, I know the state has, has these 250,000 rapid uh, tests. Do we know yet how many of those might be available uh, for um, Montgomery County residents? And the second question, based on this morning's COVID work group in Annapolis, uh, Dr. Chan said the COVID vaccines that we may be getting um, would require two shots, and she said will require special handling with refrigerators that can go and handle uh, 70 below Celsius. Do we have those kinds of facilities in the county? Well, to your first question, we actually don't have any further details um, related to the 250,000 uh, tests that the state will get. Uh, we've not received any further details in terms of the dissemination policies, the percentage that will be shared with each of the jurisdictions. As a county executive mentioned, the only thing we really know at this point is that there will be an effort to prioritize nursing homes and other congregate uh, living facilities where there are our most vulnerable populations. Uh, and so as we find out more, we'll be happy to uh, make that available. But at this time, we've not received any further information uh, beyond the initial uh, press release that happened about two weeks ago now. Now, as it relates to the actual vaccine. So a lot of the information that is coming out is rapidly coming out. So for example, that 
information that was released this morning is new information to many of us. Um, after this call, I actually do have a call. We have a, a uh, the health officers meet with officials from MDH uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We have a one hour call where we find out a lot of these details and information. And so from my understanding, what has been released so far by the federal government is that yes, a, a, a vaccine candidate will likely require two shots most likely 21 to 28 days apart. Uh, and there are some concerns or considerations that it would require some level of refrigeration uh, in terms of transport back and forth. That's the extent of the knowledge we have so far. But what I will say is we do immunizations and we run a vaccine program on a regular basis anyway. And we do have uh, you know, materials and uh, resources to refrigerate vaccines and keep them okay and to be able to transport them from place to place. And certainly as we find out more details in terms of what the federal government is thinking and they share those with us, we will be able to devise a more specific program and platform to be able to address the dissemination and concerns for the vaccine. Janekia Grimshaw from uh, WDVM has a couple of questions. Would you like to ask him or do you want me to, Janekia? There you are. Uh, so you kind of answered this, Dr. Gales, but I just want to make sure I'm clear here. So these increases, the increases with uh, the COVID-19 uh, testing results, does this set us back now? Like, could this make uh, businesses close if, this, if you continue to see these numbers? The short answer is yes, and the long answer is yes also. Uh, you know, we, we are working hard to make sure that anything, any of our reopening provisions, again, are guided, guided by surveillance data and have numerous provisions in place to keep people safe. You know, the extensive work of the different teams from Dr. Stoddard, folks from our licensing and regulatory service team looking through all of these different proposals and platforms are vetting and thinking very carefully through that lens and say, if this is an open provision, how do we maximize the, the safety precautions around it to minimize potential transmission? Uh, but as we've talked about with schools, the same situation with opening up businesses, we can put extensive safety precaution programs in place, but in order for them to be successful, they are all dependent upon having lower community transmission. Again, if we've got higher community transmission, that is increasing the likelihood that before I even step into your venue with your well thought out safety precaution program, I, I'm, it's increased likelihood that I'm going to introduce and bring COVID into that, that space. And so if that, pers if that likelihood increases by seeing increased cases and increased community transmission, we would potentially have to walk back some of the provisions that we put into place. And so what we've been working on behind the scenes is coming up with, again, we would look at data such as our test positivity, our cases per 100,000, our rate of transmission, uh, those types of variables, we're coming up with clear language that we can release to the public so they understand and get it. Um, now, it wouldn't necessarily say, if we get to 93 cases a day and the rate of transmission is 1.1 and test positivity is 6.7, then that's the magical marker to move. But we would certainly release the principles that we've talked about consistently um, in terms of those levels to determine how we would move forward in a phase or if we would potentially need to move back. And I would just add that we have followed the, the data very closely and carefully. Uh, and for example, when we had a contact tracing report that showed us that um, restaurant activity related to alcohol was associated with it, we stepped in and said, you know what? We have clear evidence that this particular activity is contributing to that. And that's when we put in the provision to say we would curb alcohol sales after a certain time. And since then, you know, we have seen the number of complaints and compliance orders that have been put into place decrease as a result of that action. Okay, there's um, another question from Donna St. George with uh, the Washington Post for Dr. Gales. Hi, Dr. Gales. Um, I wanted to follow up on this school issues that you mentioned? You said of the nine investigations that are new this week, were they all um, 
private and parochial schools? Were some of them public schools? Can you tell us any more about that? And secondly, um, you mentioned one case that could involve multiple students. Can you tell us more about that case and I guess the other one that's an ongoing investigation? Sure. Well, I, for the second component of the question is we literally uh, were just made aware of that situation overnight and we're continuing to investigate that and find out more information. Uh, and so again, our first priority right now is to make sure that we conduct a thorough investigation um, and are able to release that information to the school and to the parents and to the contacts who are involved first. So that's what our team is working on right now. Uh, and so to your first question, uh, yes, the schools that have been involved uh, related in these particular investigations have been uh, non-public schools. Rebecca Tan with um, The Post has a follow-up question. There is a little bit of time, Rebecca. Hi, I just wanted to clarify. So the new tests that you guys have gone from Cyan di uh, Diagnostics, uh, these are spit tests, correct? And then um, another follow-up question for Dr. Gales. Can you talk a little bit more about why the volume of testing is declining in Montgomery County? You said fewer people seem to be coming in to get tested. Why is that happening? So your first question actually is not correct. So as we stated, the, the collection mechanism is through interior NAERS testing. Um, mm -hmm. And the Scion lab tests are consistent with what we've been doing over the last month. Uh, we've been working with that lab. Now, as we look to form partnerships with new labs and bring new labs online, we are looking at uh, bringing back other types of self-collection mechanisms, such as saliva-based kits, uh, oral pharyngeal swabs, uh, and you know potentially leveraging some of this new technology around rapid testing. Um, so, so that's where we stand with that. Now, as it relates to testing volume, the testing volume, excuse me, has been down across the state. Uh, it's not something that's just unique to Montgomery County. And in fact, when we've looked at the numbers, uh, we've actually had a higher total of tests on, on even on those days where we, we've seen lower tests across the state, a higher percentage of those tests are coming from our jurisdiction. So we think a number of phenomena happening. One is that we think there is some testing fatigue, uh, again, consistent with some of the other things that we've mentioned, you know, less compliance potentially in terms of wearing those face coverings and physical distancing and minimizing exposure and contact to folks outside of our households and our networks. Um, and so we think that that a little bit of that is happening. Um, you know, I don't think it's 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 tied to access per se, because we do have an extensive network of testing opportunities in the county and other places. I do think some of it is also influenced potentially by, if you can think back to several weeks ago, there was this little bit of confusion where the CDC came out and said, you know, asymptomatic people should not be tested. And so I think, and that has been clarified since then, but I think that also caused some confusion in the general population, both for consumers, as well as potentially healthcare providers who may not have been, um, or maybe, you know, may have been reticent to test asymptomatic folks moving forward after those guidelines. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a multitude uh, of those different factors. Now, on our end, we're continuing to, you know, ramp up our, our testing apparatus to recover from where we were. Um, and, you know, we want to resume uh, employee testing. We also hope to resume our pop-up testing venues as well within the next week or so. And the last thing I would, would highlight is, during this time period where we've had transitions in labs, our team, uh, the logistics teams has, has been working hard to uh, get our online scheduling platform back up that is up and running again, as well as building an online notification system of results. Um, and from my understanding that is being beta tested today and hopefully will go live so that for example, individuals who provide their email address uh, will get an email notification with their results uh, within 48 hours, hopefully, uh, when, their, uh, when, you know, when their specimen is collected. Rosbelis Quinones has a question. She's from Univision Univision, Washington. Rosbelis. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, so you mentioned that you were uh, considering to allow restaurants to uh, sell alcohol after 10 p.m. Uh, and I would like to know when 
they will be allowed to do that. If you have like a estimate time date. So what we have right now is a, is a, we had a conversation on Monday with our restaurants and what we have is a, is a, is something that was proposed and we have to work out the details on. Uh, in short, what it will be is essentially a potentially an opt-in program where people who wish to go beyond 10 p.m. and go to midnight will be allowed to do so, but in doing so, they'll agree to a series of enhanced uh, provisions, particularly as it relates to having personnel on site to, whose specific job will be to monitor um, the physical distancing, face covering, et cetera, inside the restaurant. But also, what would also be a part of this is we would do enforcement upon those locations that opt in during the time frame that they've opted in for. And if we find violations, we will rescind their approval to opt in, meaning that we would allow people to operate from 10 p.m. to midnight. But it, you know, if we saw that they weren't upholding what they've committed to do, it would be they would be their their approval to do so would be removed. And so uh, that's what we're essentially building out. Obviously, we just had this conversation on Monday afternoon. We have to build in the 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 basically the essentially it's a permit that allows them to go beyond that the, that time frame. And we're building out the rules. And the rules actually will largely be based on a proposal that. Several of the chambers of commerce did make to us that were actually pretty good. I think we're likely to make small modifications to those to add a few additional things that we think are important. And then those will be largely what the, what the rules will be that the businesses who wish to opt in will be. I'm hoping that we'll have something for more firm consideration by the end of the week. And then we'll be able to you know, have that in place over the next week to 10 days. Thank you. Brianna Arikusuma from Bethesda has a question for Dr. Gales on testing. Brianna? Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, wondering if you could say uh, what is the county's current testing capacity um, and about how many tests per week are, are you all administering? Uh, I actually I don't have that the exact number uh, in front of me, uh, but our test capacity right now mirrors where we were uh, back in early August, where we're able to uh, provide upwards of you know well over a thousand tests a day in the different uh, venues. Now, to the earlier question in terms of, of of lower test results, is you know many days we have our capacity has exceeded the demand. Um, and that has been a little different. For example, since we've opened up the CDC trailer uh, at the Lake Forest website, uh, not the website, the Lake Forest uh, site, uh, we've been able to, uh, we've actually exceeded our schedule. So we've scheduled 300 folks each session and we've done well over 400 tests during that time period. Now, conversely, you know, our site at the Silver Spring Civic Center which we had tested well over a thousand folks on multiple days, uh, we still have the capacity to do that level of testing, but we're seeing uh, lower numbers. Um, I think the other day we had 700 slots open and we maybe tested, I think it was only 400 folks who came in. So we are doubling down on making sure we reach out to the community to remind them that we have tests available and to remind folks that it's important as the county executive mentioned in his opening remarks that asymptomatic and symptomatic folks should get tested uh, to know their status on a routine basis. But if you know, we'd be happy to follow up and get some of that the, the specific information to you all after this. Shen Wu uh, with the Washington Times had a question that also asked about how many tests the county could administer each day. But never mind, you already have uh, answered that. Um, let's see, there's also, wait a minute, she's adding something. So I want to clarify something Dr. Gales said, 1,000 tests a day at a site, so possibly thousands a day? No, so this is inclusive of all of the different sites that we have. You know, every site is different. Uh, the sites have different hours um, and they have different capacities. So some of them are indoors, some of them are drive through. So it depends on the site. So the number that I mentioned is inclusive of all of the different um, arms of our testing team, including ready responders, uh, essentially nursing home and assisted living places, uh, the different sites, stationary sites that we have set up, um, as well as our testing in shelters and other places that we provide testing support for. Kate Ryan at WTOP would like to have a follow-up question for the county executive. Kate. 
Thank you very much. Um, to the county executive, a question on uh, Labor Day surge, and also to Dr. Gales. When will you know if, in fact, we've seen a surge in cases due to uh, Labor Day? And then a follow-up with Dr. Gales. I believe yesterday you mentioned 12 school investigations related to COVID cases. So is it nine or 12? I just want to verify that. So related to Labor Day, we're seeing the surge of cases right now. So, um, you know, Labor Day is over a week and a half ago, uh, um, 10 days ago, nine to 10 days ago. So mm -hmm. typically you would expect to start to see cases within that four to 14 day window. And right now we are maybe, we're 10, nine days out. So we, we've already seen a, a surge in cases um, related to the holiday and potentially going back, if you track back to potentially, um, and again, this isn't saying definitively, but potentially to the date when uh, phase three provisions and reopening provisions were put into place across the state. Now, as it relates to the contact, uh, the, 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 the school piece, uh, so the, the number 12 that I used last week at that time was the number of schools where we had confirmed cases involving students, staff, and or teachers. Now, that, and at the time we also had seven schools where there had been reports of COVID-like illnesses that ultimately the, the, the folks involved tested negative, and so we didn't count that in that number. Since then, in terms of the update, there have been nine other schools where we have seen cases, or based upon my read, we have seen COVID-like symptoms developed concerning for COVID cases. And in seven of those situations, there have been, those results have ultimately turned up negative. And so when I, it's important to, to again, make sure folks at home understand this, is the guidelines require schools and businesses and everyone, particularly the schools, by COMA regulations, if you have a COVID positive confirmed test, lab test, or a, someone who has, a, who has reported that they are experiencing COVID-like symptoms, and we know there's a full spectrum of COVID-like symptoms, by virtue of the guidelines provided from the Department of Health and the governor's office related to school reopening, they are required to report those to the local health department and necessitate potential investigation. So originally 12 of those, when we talked last week, 12 of those had confirmed cases that we actually had a lab result to confirm a case. Seven of those at that time had COVID-like illnesses that turned out to be negative when they were tested for COVID. And the update is nine, nine schools since then have had COVID-like illnesses reported. Seven of them have been confirmed negative. And the other two, one of them, uh, and has involved a, a, a teacher and uh, a child within their family network. Uh, but at this time, we don't have, uh, we, we believe that there were no other students potentially exposed. And the other situation is a new situation where a student has tested positive and we're looking into to see if there were other students uh, who that student was around um, that would potentially need to be quarantined. I hope that clarified and answered your question. I just will also add, not only does the school have to respond to COVID-like illness, the health department has to respond to COVID-like illness in the same way, because typically we don't have the test results. And so obviously each one of these investigations is, is attention being applied to that situation to try and make it safe that, that you know, does take away from our resources to do other things. Okay, and uh, with that, I think we don't have any more questions on the chat. Going once, going twice for the members of the media. I guess it is a wrap, almost an hour. <laughs> almost an hour. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank, Thank you all. You.